Hello and welcome to this demo of protecting your EMC Extreme IO data with XRDF RP. If we take a look at the EMC Extreme IO ecosystem, we can see that we have already a variety of solutions that we came up with in 2014, starting from system integration to application management uh, unique capabilities such as using AppSync, EMC ESI, ESA and Viper SRM. And if we focus on the business continuity ecosystem, we can see that we have the VPlex with the recover point splitter solution, recover point for virtual VMs, power path, and of course the Extreme IO XDP data protection mechanism itself. But today we're going to focus on something new, something very unique to the Extreme IO remote replication. What's make it a unique solution is really the combination of best of both worlds. From one end, we've got the Extreme IO unique snapshot capabilities. And from the other, we now have the recover point engine that can orchestrate and send those snapshots from one array to another using the very robust, very reliable recover point solution to do it. On an high level overview, it's really using the Extreme IO snapshot shipping mechanism from one side to another. It is not using the recover point splitter to do so. It provides best in the industry low RPO in terms of seconds up to 60 seconds or even uh, lower compared with other solutions in the market that are very frequently 15 minutes and above. It can provide a replication from Extreme IO to another Extreme IO array or even from an Extreme IO array to say a VNX or a VMAX at the remote site. All the replication solutions are done via async uh, replication and it also provides VMO Site Recovery Manager plus point-in-time integration. Well, why is that unique, you may ask? Because traditionally, VMO SRM only allows you to fail over to the last point-in-time, and now you can actually select the point-in-time that you want to fail over to. So in a nutshell, it is really a slam dunk in terms of replication. Okay, so this is our testing environment, and what you see here is an Extreme IO single X brick running Xios 4.0. Um, let's take a look at the configuration. We have uh, one volume that we are going to replicate. We have the repository volume where we store very small uh, recover point configuration files. And we've got the journal volume where is where recover point is actually storing the metadata changes between uh, one replication to another. Uh, so this is our source array, XBrick uh, 101. And the destination XBrick that we are going to replicate to is this one, XBrick 73. Uh, same configuration over here, the only difference is that the recovery VMFS01 does not contain any data because we are going to replicate its data from the protected VMFS01. Now let's jump to the recover point uh, configuration itself. So this is our recover point appliances. I've already connected uh, the two RPAs in each site uh, to another and you can see it over here. You can see that the source uh, site is two RPAs, which are here. You can also see the version that they are running and so on and so forth. And the same goes for the target uh, RPA cluster, which is what you see here. The first step is connecting them to the Extreme IO array. I've already done it, but let's just see how the configuration looks like. It's very straightforward. You just go and you press the Add button and you select the Extreme IO array that you wanted to. You give it a XMS IP address, the username and the password, and that's pretty much it. And then it will look like this, where it's actually found the, the Extreme IO array. The other thing that we also want to do is to connect it to a virtual uh, center at both of the sides. This is a very helpful because it will allow us to see directly from within the recover point GUI, which virtual machines are protected, which virtual machines are not protected, and which of them are partially protected. So that's very useful for cases, for example, where we have a VM that we added another device to it, but we forgot to replicate it, so we will be able to see directly from here. So this is how it looks like. If we go to the RPA cluster, register vCenter server on the tab, we can actually expand all the ESX servers. And as you can see, so far, none of the VMs that are residing on my protected site are replicated. And you can see it via the fact that they are colored in uh, just red. Can also show us on which data store they're residing. Again, very, very useful to see in real time what VMs we are protecting, what VM we are not, and what VM we are partially protected. We are now going to actually protect the protected VMFS data store. 
Um, before we do it again, we just configure the same thing at the target site. We gave it the extreme IRA at IP and password and also the virtual center at the recovery site. So let's go and create a protection uh, group. So it's very simple. You go to protection and uh, protect volumes. And the first thing you need to do is give the consistency group a name. Consistency group can be based on one data store, one volume or more than it. Depends on our RPO and the time that we want to maybe fail over all of them to the same point in time. I just call it CG01. And we call the protection name VMFS01 because that's the data store that I want to replicate. We are now going to select the data store, the volume, which is this one. And we're going to replicate it from the source uh, RPA cluster. Let's take a look at the policies, the more advanced policies that we can configure if that's what we wish to do. So there we have some very clever things that we can actually do here. For example, what should be the priority in terms of this specific uh, volume replication if there is a contention with another. Um, another one that is again very useful, think about it like a scale out uh, to replication. What happens if a volume uh, requests more bandwidth or more performance from the RPA that it's currently replicating it with? Well, you can actually distribute it across multiple RPAs. And in my case, I've got uh, two RPAs per cluster, currently recover point support up to eight RPAs per uh, recover point cluster. Of course, again, you can use another cluster if that's what you want to do. But again, that shows you the powerful of offloading your application to external controllers that will not distribute or will not disturb with your core IO controllers that are serving your very precious all flash array uh, latency. So this is something again you can configure from here. And let's go to the production uh, production policy itself. I'm going to replicate uh, ES6 server so I can specify VMware ES6 here. What should be the maximum number of snaps? That is of course a temporary number. You can change it as much as you wish to. Of course, every version will have its own uh, limitation, upper limits and lower limits in terms of replication. I just leave it as it is right now and press the OK button. So we've already selected the volume that we want to replicate. Now we're going to define the production journal. So again, the journal is where we store our uh, metadata information. So we've already created the volume itself. It can be very small. Actually, here I just created a large one. But in real life, the journal volume should probably be around 10 to 15 gig, although it doesn't really matter because we do not consume capacity unless it's unique on the array itself. So I'm just going to select it. The journal configuration itself also have a simple and advanced pattern. So if you want to go to the advanced configuration, just press the modify policy. And you can have many operations here. For example, we can create a journal template and then just configure another one. We can compress the journal. Again, very, very useful if that's what we want to do. Um, we can maximize the journal lag if we want to do in terms of capacity and so on and so forth. We can require a protection window, enable the recover point snapshot consolidation to occur at a specific time of the day and how long will those snapshots needs to run before we consolidate them. Again, the powerful uh, engine of recover point that's been there for years now, very reliable engine. I'm not going to configure anything special here, so I'm just going to press the cancel button. And now we are going to select the recovery volume that we want to recover to. So first I need to select the RPA cluster that I'm going to replicate it to. In my case, it's itzik underscore target. We give it a name. And this is where the fun begins. Uh, to start with, we can select RPO, which is again unique in the industry based on many, many intervals. RPO can mean time, but it can also mean capacity. So we can select capacity as part of our RPO. But in the sake of this example, I'm just going to select it in terms of time. Uh, we will support 60 seconds or less at GA. So I'm just going to do 60 here, where the majority of the competition out there is around 15 minutes. Again, that's because of the fact that we are offloading the replication to an external controller while not interfering with the core I.O. behavior. And now we're going to select the volume that we are actually going to replicate it to. So this is the recovery volume that uh, I've showed you before. I'm just going to select it and press OK. And like everything else that I showed you before, you can do it at the easy button or you can go to a more advanced policy. Let's just go there and see what we can actually select. And the host OS is VMware ESX. The number of snaps that we can change if we want to. 
Uh, but the really important part is the link policy tab. It's a very useful, especially in cases where you have a low latency or where you actually want to set your RPO. So if you go to the replication mode, it's going to be async-based. Snap replication can be set to either continuous or periodic. Continuous basically means that the moment that the snapshot has been committed to the remote site with the remote RPAs and the extreme IO array over there or any other array, it will start and generate a new snapshot. The other option is to go with the periodic snapshot, which means the time between the time that it takes the first snapshot to the second to the third and so on and so forth, and which where you can actually uh, set it here. So that's another way to configure it. Um, again, you can also set up compression on the snapshots themselves. Very, very useful because the Recalpon compression engine is very powerful and very useful, especially in cases where there is a low, where there is a high latency between the sides that you are replicating to. Remember, this is an async-based replication. So for example, the protected site can reside in the east of the US and the recovery site can reside on the west of the US where your latency may be very high in between the sites so you can compress the data. And you can also enable deduplication on the snapshot shipping itself between one site to another. This is a supported now on Gen 5 RPAs, which are the RPAs that we are supporting with Extreme IO. Again, another layer of compressing the data before you ship it to the remote site. Okay, the next part is to configure the journal at the remote site. So I'm just going to press the button. And again, I've already prepared <coughs> the journal volume. So I'm just going to select it. And now let's just display. This is the summary of what we just configured. I can do add the copy and then start another wizard, or I can just press the finish button and that will start with the CG creation itself. And this is exactly what's uh, happening right now. So we can already see that it created the CG. And of course, now it will take some time to replicate the data from one side to another. I especially love the GUI because it shows you in a very nice visual form uh, the status of the sites and the status of the replication itself. And there you go. You can start to see that it's starting with the replicating of the snapshot itself. Um, the initial one, of course, again, will take time. But if you go back to the array where the interesting part is happening, we can actually see that it now created a snapshot that it's going to then uh, replicate to the remote site, which is here. This is the snapshot at the destination site. And now let's just give it some time to finish with the actual replication itself. And we go back to it. If we now go to the main dashboard, we can actually see the status of the replication itself. So for example, you can see warning. And if you go to the warning, you can see that those have been generated because there are many VMs that we are not replicating. Another very useful thing to note here is that you can see what is the replication method between the different RPAs. You can go via IP or fiber channel. Of course, if the site latency between the different sites is short or very low, you can go with fiber channel replication. But for the sake of our example, I'm actually using the replication over IP. You can see what's the system traffic across the, the volumes, whether it's the source site or the destination site. Again, very, very useful for troubleshooting or just taking a look at your infrastructure itself. If you go if we go back to the vCenter tab, you can now see that the VMs that are residing on the data store that I'm replicating are actually appearing as green. That's because I am actually replicating them. So that's again, the integration between uh, Recover Point, Extreme IO and the Virtual Center. Okay, so the replication is now down. And if we go back to the journal, we can starting to see all the point in time that the journal is taking and all the point in time that we can actually recover from. So a very, very efficient uh, recover point integration with Extreme.io via XRDF RP. Okay, now that we finally protected our CG, let's examine the recover point recovery option. So this is the consistency group that we created. And as you can see, it's still replicating. It's continuing replicating many, many snapshots based on the RPO that we set. The first option is to do a test copy, which is really just going to provision this volume uh, snapshot as another LAN while still continuing with the replication itself. So it's not going to stop the replication, it's just going to take a point in time once we set it and retrieve and map the volume to, to do our testing on. The second option is recover production. This is a very interesting feature. It means that although I've replicated my data to a remote uh, Extreme IO site and a remote Extreme IO uh, with RPAs, I'm going to take the data from that remote site, copy it to my production site, and perform the restore operation at the production site. This is very useful in cases 
where my production site is still up and running, but my data reside at the remote site because, for example, my data at the production site become corrupted or something like it. And of course, then we also have the option of uh, failing over. So this is the traditional uh, DR operation. So let's see how it goes. So let's do failover. And now I'm going to select the copy that I want to recover to. The next step is to select an image from all the different images that we have. Uh, we can select the last one, or as we said, uh, we can select from many, many more. Uh, if you may remember, although we specified uh, 60 seconds as the RPO, you can actually see that it was uh, far lower than this in terms of the time uh, that it took to recover point to create snapshot back in time. Um, so we're just going to select the random one, let's say this one, and then we do the next uh, failover. Before we do the failover, I also want to show you the recovery environment. So this is this one. And as you can see, this is my vCenter, the remote recovery site. It only has the volume that is residing to. And let's going to see what's actually going to happen once we declare a failover. So we're going to start the failover process itself. It's going to run the enabling image access. And then very quickly, it will present this volume as a recovery volume to the recovery site. So let's see how that works. There you go, it's already changed the storage to large logged access. Okay, and that's it. The failover just uh, occurred. And what we can do now is take a look at the recovery site. So what I'm going to do now is just rescan the volumes at the remote sites to make them visible so I can mount and register those VMs at the recovery site. So that's the volume we are going to mount. As you can see, because it's a snapshot volume from the original one, the signature and the name of the volume still exists from the production site, which is why Whisper is going to ask me whether I want to keep the existing signature or assign a new one, just assign a new signature. That's what we want. Press next, finish. And that's about it. Now the ES6 servers at the remote sites are seeing the volume. There you go, you can now see the mounted volume. If you want to go ahead, we can rename its suffix back to the original one. And we can also go ahead and browse the data store and see all the VMs that are there and mount them back. Let's do it for one. Mount it back, the recovery site. And there you go. I can now go ahead and power on the VM to see that the data is, of course, still there. It's going to tell me that I moved the files, which makes sense. And that's it. Let's open the console on that VM. There you go. The VM is up and now running. And if we want, we can now start a, a failback operation, uh, as long as, of course, the production RPAs and the arrays are there to present. Typically, we're probably going to use VMware Site Recovery Manager to do so, including, of course, the failover operation. But just for the sake of the demo, I wanted to show you how to do it. The next part will, of course, be integrating with VMware SRM. Okay, the last part of the integration is the integration with VMware Site Recovery Manager, known as SRM. SRM 5.8 is a web-based uh, installed, and as you can see, it's been already pre-configured. I also set up the consistency group of recover point to be handled by a VMware SRM. However, the challenge with SRM is that it will always allow you to fall back to the last point in time, and that not may not be that useful in many cases. For example, a logical corruption. I mean, I will be able to fail over to the last point in time with the corruption inside of the VM. So, what do you do? Well. Luckily, we also have integration with the VSI plugin, and in order to go to the VSI plugin for this specific use case, you go to the classic vCenter interface. You go to the VM or to the VMs that you want to fail over. So in this case, I've got my four VMs over here, which are part of this consistency group here, which is the same consistency group that you see uh, right now. And what I can do now is go back to the VSI plugin specifically set the VM that I want to fail over to the specific point in time, go to the EMC VSI tab. And as you can see here, I've got many, many points in time that I can fail over to that again, allow you to bypass this SRM limitation of always failing over to the last point in time. In order to apply the point in time that you want to, you just go to the specific point in time you want to fail over to, press the apply button, and that's 